if you are undertaking digital transformation project regardless of how many systems you use in your architecture you need to understand their roles and responsibilities and how they are going to impact your business processes in this video we are going to be talking about all different systems and the role that they play in the enterprise architecture everyone my name is sam gupta i am principal at elevate iq elevate iq is the independent erp and digital transformation consulting firm we help our clients with digital transformation roadmap development business case development system selection as well as um, system integration so let's go back to today's topic which is going to be different systems for your enterprise architecture in 2023 based on the innovation happening in the market the boundaries of each of the systems are changing and then blurring and because of that it's really important to understand where they are in their journey and what role they are going to be playing in your architecture so we look at the changing landscape on a yearly basis we published this list last year as well and this year we have updated with the developments that we are seeing in each of the categories and how they are evolving so this list is based on that so now let's look at the list number 10 on our list is going to be project management systems and typically when you are going to be looking at project management systems this is probably going to be relevant for companies that are in the project centric space these project management systems are going to be for companies that are really in the project business and they deliver these project as part of their offering some of the examples of these projects and the businesses are going to be for example let's say if you have the software development firms marketing firms accounting firms or law firms architecture firms these are going to be the companies that are probably going to be utilizing the project management capabilities and the systems there are two possibilities when you are going to be using the project management systems in your architecture number one could be when your architecture is going to be completely siloed then the independent project management module might make sense but as you grow you might require the project management to be integrated with your procurement you might need it to be integrated with your financials because you need the financial data embedded as part of your project management processes the other case when you might require a dedicated project management software is going to be when you have outgrown the core ERP capabilities that are provided as part of your suite and you might gain far more efficiencies if you are going to be using the best upgrade software and some of the larger firms they are going to use a specialized project management software because number one they might have far deeper IT capabilities in managing this thick integration between your project management as well as financials so they might utilize a best upgrade software project management software the role of project management software in the architecture is going to be really managing that project nature of the business when it is going to be part of the offering it is not really to execute your internal project for example let's say if you are going to be constructing a building and in some cases you might utilize a siloed project management software even for that because it does not really impact your operations so it's okay to have that as siloed and that's why the project management category exists as part of your enterprise architecture so that's number 10 now 
number nine is going to be data warehouse or data lake. When people think of data warehouse, data lake, sometimes there is always going to be a very thin line between your operational and the transactional system versus your analytical systems. The goal of analytical systems is going to be to facilitate the study. It's not really to perform your transactions. Typically for your study, the data integrity is not going to be as critical as you are going to have with your transactional systems. Because when you are going to have issues with your transactional systems, that impacts your cycle time, that impacts your lead time, how you are serving the customers with the analytical systems, they are going to be equally critical, but they don't necessarily impact your operations. So they can be siloed. And most of the SMBs, well, first system that they need to really install is going to be your transactional systems. And once they are successful with those, then they might utilize the data warehouse data lake. Now, the other importance of data warehouse data lake is going to be when you have multiple systems in your architecture and you need a centralized place and the centralized analytics coming from many different systems. Sometimes you might overlay your market data along with your internal data. Now, keeping your market data inside your ERP system is probably a terrible idea. So that's why the data warehouse data lake systems are really designed for keeping any sort of additional data that you might require. And if you are going to be really sophisticated in your analytical capabilities, then you might have layers and layers of programming on top of your the raw data that you're going to get from many different systems that you might have in your architecture. And you are either going to be completing the incomplete data or sometimes you might actually send the complete data to your ERP system as well or any other transactional system but that is just going to be a feed. It's not going to have direct impact on the system. It's going to be just a data feed that typically goes to your transactional systems. Most SMB companies, if they are using just a couple of systems, they might be okay in having just the analytics layer on top of their ERP system, but the larger organizations might require a dedicated data warehouse. The other consideration that you may, may want to have with respect to your data warehouse data lake system is when you are going to be migrating your ERP system, typically it's very hard for ERP systems to carry over that historical data because of the tightness of the data. Uh, it's very, very, very hard to do that in the ERP system. So for the forecasting, for the analytics, what typically you are going to do is you are going to bring all of this data for last 5, 10, 15 years depending upon what your need is with respect to your uh, reporting and as well as um, from the forecasting perspective. So if you want to keep that historical data, typically your data warehouse is going to be a better candidate overall in keeping that data. Your transactional systems are not necessarily designed for that. So that's number nine. Now, number eight is going to be the business intelligence software. Even with business intelligence software, there's a lot of confusion. There are a lot of systems in the market that are in the business intelligence category, and sometimes they position themselves as more of the transactional platform. Some of the examples of business intelligence software is going to be when you talk about any sort of business intelligence, such as your tableaus of the world power BI, then you are going to have SNOP platform. And these are going to be the sales and operations platform, such as your adaptive planning or Anaplan or Planful. These are the systems that are going to be doing a lot of forecasting. Typically, they overlay market data on top of your internal data, and they might have additional data set that they may need for this analytics. So that's why the SNOP systems are probably going to be the better candidate for that kind of analytics. You cannot confuse them with your transactional systems. Transactional systems play much greater role in your architecture than simply doing the study, simply doing the forecasting. And typically after doing the forecasting, the forecasting system is simply going to provide the feed to your ERP system that they are going to use in its transactions when they are going to be processing these transactions. The other category that are upcoming and it's going to be probably broader 
are going to be, for example, CPM. CPM has been there for a while. Sometimes CPM is going to be part of your SNOP platform. In fact, all of the SNOP platform are now becoming far broader in scope. Traditionally, they did the analytics just for one function. Now they are able to do it for finance, for HR, for sales operations. Now some companies are also trying to get into the marketing analytics space. Now this marketing analytics is not really the marketing analytics that you are going to get as the siloed system. Here we are talking about the financial analysis of the market data. So that's where this marketing category is going to be relevant. Now, there are some other systems in the production, in the operations, as well as manufacturing space. For example, ODP, Operational Data, data Platform. Now, this Operational Data Platform is also a, a sort of business intelligence tool that you are going to have as part of your workflow. Now, what these business intelligence software are trying to do is, number one, they are trying to provide the pre-built workflows for your specific need, for your specific use case, so you don't have to invest as much in building the analytics layer, and it could be plug and play for your business. So that's the business intelligence software. Some SMBs might use business intelligence software on top of their ERP. Sometimes they might have many different systems that they might be using as part of the architecture, and they might plug the business intelligence software on top of your data warehouse platform or data lake, as opposed to hooking up directly with your ERP system. But the key with the business intelligence software is always going to be not to confuse this with your transactional system. As long as you have a clear boundary between what is a business intelligence software versus what is a transactional system, you should be okay with your enterprise architecture. So that's your number eight. Now, number seven is going to be integration technologies. And there are many different integration technologies and they play very different role in the architecture. And sometimes less seasoned enterprise architects, they are going to be mixing the technologies. And if you don't have an architect as part of your team, they probably would not know the difference in how these different technologies work and, and what are going to be their limitations based on different data sets. So some of the integration technologies are going to be really at the UI level. For example, let's say if you look at any of the e-commerce centric integrations, they are going to be probably done by web hooks. Now that integration is very fragile in general. And typically when you are going to be looking at any sort of enterprise centric integration where dollars are going to be involved, where finance is going to be involved, you probably need the guaranteed performance for those transactions and you cannot afford to miss even a single penny. And that's why the integration for the enterprise systems is going to be very different overall. Now, when you look at the integration space, there are many different technologies that are upcoming. For example, you might come across things such as iPaaS, or that is going to be integration platform as a service. These platforms typically provide the connectivity, the integration layer for many different applications. Now, some people get confused and they might utilize ETL tools for the service layer integration. Now, ETL technology is really designed for your database to database replication. They might have ways of integrating your web services or the service layer, but the way the design is of these ETL technologies, that is designed for your massive data movement between your databases. So when you are going to be integrating from database to database, that's where your ETL is probably going to be fed. When you are going to be integrating at the service layer, that's where one of the iPaaS is probably going to be a better candidate. When you are integrating, let's say, from the UI layer perspective, there are a lot of different technologies that are available in the UI space as well, but that is probably going to be the most fragile, but also the easiest way of integrating different technologies as well as the systems in the architecture. There are some of the upcoming technologies, for example, RPA, as well as workflow integration tools that are prevalent in the market. And a lot of people just mix things up when they are going to be thinking about these technologies. RPA is really designed for very ad hoc user-centric workflows. They are not necessarily 
designed for your enterprise grade validation or using them for your enterprise workflows when you are going to be automating any of the processes for let's say you have controller and they are trying to delegate some of their own core responsibility in terms of scanning the documents or performing some of the admin tasks that's where the rpa is going to be handy but the, any of the enterprise workflows rpa is probably not going to be a good candidate now the second one is the workflow technologies and this is going to be something like service now you have Zoho Creator and then Boomi Flow, and there are many different workflow technologies that are available in the market. And everybody sort of tries to market them together as part of just one technology umbrella. That is not necessarily true with these technologies. They have their own strengths and weaknesses and where they are going to be fit. Typically, workflow technologies are going to be handy for any of the scenarios when you are integrating the ad hoc processes that are going to be part of your enterprise workflow. For example, let's say if you need to do any sort of master data validation or you need to create a process to accept the vendor form and that directly goes in your ERP. Now that's a great candidate for the workflow technology because they are not as ad hoc as your RPA, but then they also have a way to accommodate any sort of validation, but they are probably not going to be as rigid as implementing them inside your ERP system. One more technology category that you might hear is going to be BPM, which is the business process management. It has been there for a while. There are a lot of companies that are doing a lot more work in the BPM space. Typically, BPM is going to be the overarching layer that sits on top of your integration platform. BPM is going to have uh, or they will be able to include user inputs along with your technical systems integration. Typically, with the uh, when you look at the core iPasses, they typically do not accommodate the workflow that you are going to have as part of your user inputs. So these are the different integration technologies. You might require just one, you might require several, depending upon your use case, what you are trying to do. So make sure you understand these technologies deeply and figure out which one is going to be the right fit for, for your architecture. So that's number seven. Now, number six is going to be manufacturing software, and this is the MES bucket. Now, if you talk to a lot of OT people, they might argue that MES, when they hear the word, they are probably thinking very integrated solution, just one solution that does a lot more from the operations perspective, from the shop floor perspective. But the MES is a category. So whether you are going to be using combination of technologies or you are going to be using just one technology that can play the role of MES, you need to still figure out your enterprise architecture, how these different systems that are going to be part of your architecture, how they are going to be talking to each other. Depending upon how busy and critical your shop floor is, you could utilize different technologies that are going to be part of that MES layer that you need to have. Sometimes you are integrating this with your different machines that you might have on the shop floor. Whether you talk about scales, whether you talk about vision system, sometimes you are going to be integrating this with your edge devices. Now, from the network perspective, also there are different boundaries that you need to have between your IT and OT because OT has different cybersecurity risks concern. And that's why MES typically is going to be a very different category overall, but it needs to be part of the enterprise architecture. If you have any of the scenarios where you are utilizing MES, also it's going to be critical how you are setting the boundaries between your ERP as well as MES technologies. Who is going to be responsible for scheduling? Who is going to be responsible for quality? There is no one size fits all and depending upon you know your use case depending upon your business priorities depending upon how you want to architect this uh, everything is going to have pros and cons so you need to really make sure that okay whatever you are trying to do design those workflows make sure you understand what these technologies are really good for and where they are going to be fit based on the use case and then use them accordingly so that's number six <music> Now, number five is going to be supply chain software. And there are many different software that is going to be 
part of this bucket. For example, let's say if you talk about any of the procure to pay systems, and these are best of breed system, they have some very unique functionality that is probably not going to be part of your ERP system. For example, when you are looking at that Amazon like buying experience, if you are going to be asking every single person in your organization to log into your ERP, create POs, that requires a lot more training time. So P2P systems typically make it easy for your users who are simply going to be ordering, let's say the laptop or mouse, and this is going to be your corporate purchasing workflow so that you can have the approval process. Now, when you are going to be using a dedicated best of breed system, then you also have to worry about the integration of that system with your ERP. Sometimes these systems are going to be pre-integrated. Sometimes they are not going to be pre-integrated. So depending upon the IT maturity that you have, depending upon how sophisticated you are with the integration capabilities, you might need to evaluate the pros and cons of that. The other supply chain systems that you are going to see is going to be WMS TMS, which is your warehouse management system. TMS uh, is going to be your transportation management system. Most of the companies, especially the product centric, are going to use some sort of WMS system. And it is probably the first system that most companies are going to be utilizing, even if they might be on an accounting software. The role of WMS is to enable the barcoding that is typically the most critical need for product centric companies. The role of TMS is going to be integrating it with carrier, printing all of the documentation that you are going to be requiring from the TMS perspective also enable the rate shopping. Now, when you look into the TMS category or WMS category, that could become really big overall. And sometimes there might be overlapping boundaries between what WMS and TMS can do. So you need to set clear boundaries between, okay, what is the role of WMS in my architecture? What is the role of TMS in your architecture? Now, there are some other supply chain categories and they are becoming extremely thick in their capabilities. And sometimes they feel that the role of ERP is just going to be accounting. So whether you are going to be hosting these processes inside your supply chain software or inside ERP, everything is going to have pros and cons. Okay. And it's going to have impact on your process. Sometimes the experience might be easier on the front end side of the process, but that might increase effort for the back end and from the maintenance perspective. So again, there's no clear answer in terms of whether you should be utilizing a supply chain software for your supply chain processes versus ERP. Every design is going to have pros and cons. So depending upon where your critical success factors are, you need to figure out, okay, how many systems do I have in the architecture and what role they each are going to play in the architecture. So that's number five. Number four is going to be human capital management and human capital management is critical for companies that are going to be uh, extremely heavy with the human resources processes. And when people think about ERP, they are all going to be thinking, hey, I am getting an ERP. Why can't I host my HR processes uh, as part of my ERP? Because I'm going to have just one system. I don't have to worry about the integration. HCM system in general is a very, very, very different system. And you may want to isolate this. And the reason for that is because the HCM data or the HR data is one of the most confidential data that you're going to have inside your company. And that requires a very different segregation of responsibilities to make sure that you are not revealing somebody's salary or gender or whatever confidential information Maybe from the HR perspective, these are very, very, very sensitive data set and they have compliance per state, per county, depending upon where you might be operating. So that's why the ACM system is a very different system. The kind of workflows it is going to have are going to be very different as well. There might be some of the ERP systems that might claim to do a lot of different HCM functionality as well. But typically the only thing they really are doing is they have an employee record. That employee record is going to be used as part of your scheduling. But from the HR operations perspective, most of the operational functionality that your HR is going to need from the ACM processes perspective, they are probably not going to be part of the ERP. And most companies, when they think of the HCM system, they are probably going to be uh, utilizing just a payroll software in the beginning. But as their 
needs grow from the ACM perspective, they are probably going to have the standalone software. But let's say if you're going to be a hundred, two hundred million dollar company, then you might want to integrate your ACM software with your ERP. So that's number four. Now, number three is going to be e-commerce uh, or any sort of pass platform. Now, this is going to be relevant for a lot of different companies. Sometimes when we think of e-commerce, we are always going to be thinking that, okay, only the product centric companies or the companies that are going to be in the transactional business are probably going to require e-commerce. The same thing goes for pause as well. If you are going to have a storefront, then you are probably going to require some sort of pass platform. But the boundaries of e-commerce are, are extremely broad. Even the companies, let's say, for example, if you are going to be in telco media space, they are probably going to have commercial transaction that they need to process. And that's where the boundaries of digital commerce is going to be very different. And even if you don't process your transactions online, even if you don't ask your customers to pay online, even if you're simply mapping the customer journey, that is still going to be part of your digital commerce category. Inside the digital commerce category, you are going to have many different systems and the space is evolving a lot. And that is actually changing the boundary in terms of what is going to be the scope of your ERP system versus your e-commerce versus your CRM. So you need to pay attention to this one because now when you look at the unified commerce experience or the omni-channel experience, e-commerce are going to require far more data because if they don't have the data in the real time, the unified omni-channel experience is not going to work. So their scope is increasing overall in the architecture, the way their scope is, and that is going to change the scope for the other underlying system that is going to be either CRM or ERP systems. But most companies are going to have some sort of e-commerce or the pass platform that they are going to be using to process their transactions and that's number three. Now, number two is going to be ERP and accounting software. And when people think of ERP, they're always going to be thinking, okay, ERP is more of the accounting software. But the whole idea of ERP is going to be that integrated experience that is available as part of the suite. The more integrated processes and the functionality that you are able to keep in one system, the easier the architecture is going to be. Typically, ERP systems are going to be relevant for most product-centric companies. It is also relevant for a lot of construction-centric companies where you are going to be procuring materials. You are going to be accounting that as part of your project. So the main advantage that you get with the ERP system or the accounting system is going to be that your accounting and the financial processes are going to be embedded as part of your operational transaction. A lot of people might argue that, you know what, I have two choices. One is going to be, I am going to get an ERP and ERP is going to have very tightly integrated processes. They might appear extremely frightening. So my choice could be that, you know what, I am going to get all of these operational system and then going to send your GL entries to your accounting. Sure, you could do that, but you are never going to get the same forecasting capability, the same experience that you are going to get with your financial processes. When these financial processes are going to be embedded as part of your operational processes, you can make proactive decisions. You can understand the cost of each of the project, each of the transaction, you can drive the business decisions based on your financial and that is going to be super critical as you are going to grow because you require financial control across your processes. So that's why the ERP system is probably going to be one of the most critical systems that you are probably going to require in your architecture. Some companies might be able to manage just with the accounting software just because they need that for the financial reporting. But the role of ERP system in general is much broader and most companies are probably going to require that. So that's number two. Now, number one is going to be customer relationship management. In customer relationship management, category is becoming extremely broad the way customer experience is evolving. Now, customer relationship management could be 
just keeping your leads and contacts in a system. Sure, even ERP systems did that, but that's not just the intent of the CRM software. The CRM software is going to be in enabling how this customer experience is going to be touching each and every channel and how you can understand the customer journeys, what you could do from the marketing automation perspective in engaging with these customers. So that's where the customer relationship category is super critical. You have many different systems as part of your customer relationship management category. For example, let's say if you talk about customer data platform or you talk about CPQ. So all of these systems together form that category called customer relationship management and that is probably going to be important for your architecture because you want a customer relationship management software for your b2b p2c processes and initially when the smb companies are probably going to be utilizing the crm as a standalone it might not be as integrated but then you are going to lose the insight from your backend perspective you are going to be siloed in the beginning it might be okay but later on, you might need to integrate this with your ERP system. The same thing goes for larger companies. They might utilize the best of breed CRM software because it's just easier to use, easier to learn. But then your integration complexity is probably going to increase. So that's it for the system. One of the key takeaway I want you to have from these uh, systems is make sure you understand each of the categories and the role that they are going to play in your enterprise architecture. If you enjoyed watching this, we are going to include the link in the description that you can check for the detailed analysis of these categories. Also, if you prefer audio form, this podcast is also available on Spotify uh, Google, Apple. So don't forget to subscribe there. Also, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. We publish these videos weekly. On that note, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one.